Um, Mark chapter six, where we last left off, we just saw an amazing miracle of Jesus walking on the water. Uh, it was the second storm that the disciples had encountered in the gospel of Mark. And unlike the first storm, Jesus was actually over on the shore. He was praying on the mountain. He saw them in the storm though, and he went walking to them on the water and they thought Jesus was a ghost. We talked about how when Jesus shows up in your life, it's not always in the way that you expect. Sometimes you might think it's a ghost or something, but it's actually actually Jesus. And then we see Jesus gets in the boat with them and the, star, the storm was completely stopped. And it says that they were completely astounded. Um, and that's where we kind of pick up today. So uh, verse 53, it says this, it says, when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. When they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came in villages, city, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garments." And as many as touched it were made well. Um, so in uh, our teaching a couple of weeks ago with Jesus walking on the water, we learned principles from the storm and how God meets us in the storm. And one last principle uh, from this, which is really interesting that I, uh, we didn't get to two weeks ago, but I think is important to see now. In verse 45, if you go back to verse 45, it says that they were going across the sea to Bethsaida. That's where Jesus was sending them to Bethsaida. And yet in verse 53, it says they crossed over and they came to the land of Gennesaret, which is a complete portion of the countryside, which shows us here that the, the disciples in the midst of this storm, uh, they actually got blown off track. They didn't arrive at the destination that God was calling them to go and where Jesus had sent them. And in this, we see um, storms in your life, hardships in your life. They no doubt will blow you off course. You're gonna think, God, you're calling me here. I'm going in this direction. The disciples were supposed to go to Bethsaida, but they ended at Gennesaret. It's the storms of your life. It's the hardships of your life. It's the struggles and trials of your life that may blow you off course, that may redirect you, that may move you in a different direction. However, if Jesus is in the boat with you, which in this case, he is with the disciples, no direction is the wrong direction. They thought that they were supposed to go to this one place, but God redirected them and God had a purpose and a plan in the midst of that. And maybe you're here today and maybe your life is being redirected. Maybe there is a storm or some trial or a hardship that you're going through and you thought God was calling you to pursue this career, to pursue this relationship, to, 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 to whatever it might be. And now you're being redirected. If God's in that, if Jesus, is in that, if you've invited him into that process, he may, be, he may be having something different for you. And you may have to be open to redirection. God, I always wanted to go here. God, I always wanted to do this. God, I always thought this was your plan for my life. But God redirects us through storms at seasons of our life. And it's so cool that when, when they got there to the place, not where they were going, but the place where they were supposed to be, God had amazing things in store for them. It says that people from all over the countryside had heard about Jesus and there was sick people and paralyzed people and people with leprosy and all these people who needed Jesus and had the disciples not been redirected, those people would not have been able to encounter and experience the presence and the goodness of Jesus. So all that's to be said, if you're here and you're in a season of life where you feel like God may be redirecting you, he may be. And, and to just be open to that and be understanding that God has a plan for you even in the midst of that. Now, what's so interesting here, um, if you've been following with us in the gospel of Mark, it says here, when he came to the countryside, they, they brought out all these people and they implored Jesus that they might even touch, it says in verse 56, that they might even touch the fringe of his garment. Now, if you've been tracking with us in the gospel of Mark, you might remember in chapter five, there was one woman, a woman who had a flow and an issue of blood for 12 years that no doctors were able to heal and figure out what was going on. And this one woman snuck through the crowd when Jesus was passing by her village. And in the midst of the crowd, she snuck up and she barely touched the hem of his garment. And now as Jesus, 
Jesus arrives at the other side of the lake, news of this miracle must have preceded him. Word must have spread that there was this one woman in this one city who barely touched the fringe of his garment and she was healed and she was made well. And now Jesus arrives and all of the masses are trying to do the exact same thing. It says they, they brought these people out and they asked and implored that they might just barely touch the fringe of his garment. And the reason I love this so much is because the, the, this one woman had just the tiniest, smallest amount of faith to say, if I can just experience a little bit of the touch of Jesus, I can be healed. And her faith and her story and what God did in her life spread throughout the region. So now all these other people who needed to experience the touch of Jesus, who needed healing from Jesus, they had the faith to do the exact same thing as well. And so in this, I wanna encourage us and remind us to not underestimate the power of what God's done in your life. Don't underestimate your story. Don't underestimate the transformation that God's done in your life. Don't underestimate the small touch of Jesus that you may be feeling in your heart and in your life even today because even the smallest act of faith, even the smallest touch from Jesus, it could be the catalyst that somebody else needs when they hear of what God's done in your life. It could be used to bring them closer to Jesus as well. It's so cool as one lady, literally thousands of people are now flocking to Jesus us, trying to barely touch the hem of his garment because she had done the exact same thing. And so I want to just encourage you and remind you, and this is, by the way, why we have somebody share their story every single week is because what God's doing in your story, it's so much bigger than you. Like, it's not just about you. It's not just for you. What God's done in your life, the things that you've seen, the faith that, that, that you've expressed, all the things that you've experienced, it's not just for you. And that's why we have people come up here and share their stories because other people's stories can point us to who Jesus is and can challenge us and can shape us and can change us and can spark faith in us as well. And so I wanna encourage and remind all of you guys, don't underestimate what God's done in your life. Don't underestimate Estimate the power of your story. Don't underestimate that one time where you reached out to touch Jesus. It's not just for you, it's for other people as well. And so I simply wanna challenge you and encourage you to say, look for those opportunities. Look for opportunities just to share what God's done in your life, what God's doing in your story, because you never know how many thousands of people may be coming and just trying to barely touch the fringe of Jesus' garment if you share with them that that's what's happened in your life. If you share that Jesus has changed you, if you share that you you've experienced a touch of his power in your life, it can be used in such a powerful way. Amen to that. Amen. So that's the end of chapter six. Uh, well, we really, really want to focus on a portion from chapter seven. So we're just going to continue in the flow of the text, moving on to chapter seven, starting in verse one. It says, now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they they washed their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. I need to get one of those. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? So Jesus is here in the countryside. People are coming from all over, touching the, hinge of, the fringe of his garment, being healed. And in the midst of all these other people experiencing the power and the goodness of Jesus, the Pharisees show up again. Now, this is Jesus's second encounter with the Pharisees in the gospel of Mark. The first one was back in chapter three, where the Pharisees showed up and said, the only way Jesus has the power to heal is by the power of Beelzebul, ultimately saying Jesus is demon possessed. That's how he's casting out demons. So they show up again, these religious leaders, the Pharisees, and they're like, Jesus, your disciples are eating their food food 
on couches that haven't been washed. And they're eating their food before, uh, without washing their hands and without washing their copper pots. Now, why is this such a big deal? Why is it such a big deal that the disciples weren't washing their hands before they eat? This has nothing to do with good sanitation practice. This has nothing to do with hygiene. It actually had to do with ceremonial purity laws. And the Pharisees thought that Jesus' disciples, because they didn't wash their hands, they thought that they were spiritually unclean. Now, what's interesting to note is if you read through the entire Old Testament, there's only one passage of scripture where people are commanded to wash their hands, and that was the priests. In Exodus chapter 30, you can check it out for yourself later, the priests were commanded to wash their hands before they went into the temple to make a sacrifice because the sacrifice was to be pure and undefiled since it was being offered to a holy God. And so as an act of worship, when the priests would go into the temple, part of the ceremonial cleansing is that they would wash their hands so that the sacrifice would be undefiled. It was God's way of letting his people know, hey, I'm holy. If you're gonna come and make a sacrifice before me in the temple as a priest, you need to be holy for I am holy. And then Numbers chapter 18, if you're a note taker, you can write that down, check it out later. The priest and their households were allowed to eat a portion of the sacrifice food once they had been ceremonially, ceremonially clean as well. So throughout the entire Old Testament, the only people commanded according to the scriptures to wash their hands was priests and their families were allowed to eat the food once they were clean as well. So the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they took these laws that were only for the priests and they applied it to everybody. And they said, we should make everybody wash their hands as the priests do. And we should make everybody wash all their food and wash their couches and wash their copper pots so that we can make ourselves more holy before God. Now, here's the thing, their, their intentions and their heart, I think was good. They realized, wow, the priests have to do that and, and be made holy in order to go in and make a sacrifice. And so we should just do the exact same thing. And so in an attempt to make themselves holy before God, they said, we need to do all these things as well. And they didn't say, just wash your hands as was commanded for the priest. But as you saw, there was a list of stuff. They were supposed to wash after they came back from the market. They said, you know, why aren't your disciples doing that? Why aren't they washing when they come back from the market? That was because if you came in contact with a Gentile, you would be ceremonially unclean. Again, this isn't, this isn't what Jesus commanded. These are traditions that the Jewish leaders had established saying, before you come back from the market, before you eat your food, you need to wash yourself. You need to wash your hands. You need to wash your clothing. You need to even wash your dining couch. This may, may, there may have been like some COVID stuff going on where people were like washing groceries and washing couches. I don't know, probably a little bit different, but they even washed their dining couches. So all of these extra rules that they, that they added was compiled in was called the tradition of the elders. And that's what the uh, Pharisees are saying here. They're saying, hey, why don't your disciples uphold the tradition of the elders? It was a set of rules that was built around the Bible, outside of the Bible, in an attempt to be more holy holy in an attempt to show people, look how good we are, look how righteous we are. And so the Pharisees are ultimately asking Jesus, hey, why aren't your disciples holy? Why aren't they as holy as we are? Why aren't they striving for holiness? That was ultimately the root of the issue. And here's what Jesus responds by saying in verse six. It says this, and he said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men." So much for nice, fuzzy, warm, cuddly Jesus, right? The scribes are like, Jesus, why aren't your disciples as holy as us? Why aren't they washing their hands before they eat? Why aren't they washing their couches? Why aren't they washing their dining pots? And Jesus, interestingly enough, when Jesus is asked a question, most of the time, if you look at it throughout the entire gospels, Jesus almost always responds with another question or with a parable or with some sort of warning. But here he doesn't do that. He here, he says to these people asking this question, you guys are hypocrites. And it's interesting, this is the only time in the Gospel of Mark somebody is called a hypocrite. Isn't that interesting? 
The only time Jesus calls someone a hypocrite, it's not the heathens, it's not the Gentiles, it's not the tax collectors, it's not the Roman government, it's actually the religious leaders. They said, Jesus, why aren't your disciples as holy as us and doing all these things? And Jesus says, you guys are actually hypocrites. Now this word hypocrite in the Greek language, it, it comes from theater and it actually means literally to wear a mask or to play or to act. So when he says to the Pharisees, Isaiah spoke of you. You guys are hypocrites. He's saying, you guys are wearing a mask. You're putting on a show. You're acting. The mask that they were wearing was a mask and a facade of holiness according to their external traditions. Look how holy I am. Look how much I love God. Look how righteous I am. But it was all external. Oh, I washed my hands. I washed my copper pots before I ate. I washed my couch before I sat on it. And so look how spiritual I am. Look how holy. Holy I am, look how righteous I am. When God never commanded that, God never said that's what holiness is, washing your hands before you eat a meal. Although I recommend it, it's a good idea. It doesn't make you holy before God. Washing your couch before you sit on it doesn't make you holy before God. But this is what the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees had lived by. They had written their own script and they were now wearing a mask, putting on a facade of, look how holy I am, look how righteous I am. And in doing so, they rejected the commandments of God. They rejected what true holiness is actually was. They rejected what the scripture said makes a person holy, and they started living by their own convictions and their own traditions instead. Now, how does Jesus respond to this? And this is what I love so much. Check this out. How does Jesus respond to their hypocrisy when they are wearing a mask, pretending to be righteous and holy, although they've rejected God's word and are living by their own traditions? How does Jesus deal with that? Interestingly enough, to begin to unmask the Pharisees' hypocrisy Jesus appeals to the authority of the scriptures by quoting the prophet Isaiah. What Jesus does here is actually brilliant. It's so genius. They were not living according to the scriptures. They were living according to their own traditions and righteousness. And so what Jesus does, he says, Isaiah actually prophesied of you saying, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So Jesus, by upholding the scriptures and saying, Isaiah actually prophesied of you. Isaiah actually spoke of you. He was showing them the very thing that they failed to do which was live according to the word, live under the authority of the scripture, living by their own traditions to make themselves righteous rather than what God said. And I just love that so much. I think uh, a lot of times when you just read through the scriptures, you can miss things like this. Jesus is actually brilliant. He's a genius. They weren't living according to the word. And he's like, well, the word says this, Isaiah spoke of you, you guys are hypocrites and you're honoring me, not in your hearts, only with your external actions. And in doing so, he begins to rip the mask off the Pharisees. He begins to explain what was actually in their heart, which was to justify themselves and make themselves righteous rather than live according to the righteousness of the scripture. Now, there's a couple nuggets in this that we're gonna come back to in a second, but let's finish out this section continuing in verse nine. Check this out. It says, and he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, this is what the scribes and Pharisees said, you say, if a man tells his father and mother, Whatever you have gained from me is Corbin, that is, given to God. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do." So the Pharisees, they had another tradition, not just washing your hands and your couch and your pots and pans to try to be made holy before God. They had another tradition that they practiced that thought made them more righteous than everybody else. But in doing this tradition, they were actually not obeying one of the simplest commands, which was to respect and to honor your father and mother. The tradition was to claim something to be Corbin, which is given to God. Now, here's the thing. The heart behind this sounds like a really good idea to say, you know what, I'm, I'm dedicating these finances to God. I'm giving my house to God. I'm giving my time to God. Whatever it is, that sounds like a 
pretty good idea, but the Pharisees actually used it as a loophole to avoid obey, obeying the word, which was honoring your father and mother. And the loophole was you could take a piece of property or you could take some money or whatever it was, and you could declare at Corbin. You could say, I am going to use this only for God. And then your parents one day are in need. They need to borrow some money. They need a place to live. And you're like, sorry, I can't help you. I told God I'm only going to use my money for him. It's Corbin. And so this is what the Pharisees were doing. They looked so righteous. They're like, I've given my house to God. I've given my money to God. I've given my time to God. And in doing so, they weren't actually able to help anybody else. Wouldn't that be a really nice loophole to have? Like, I'm just saying, the Pharisees, as, as, as wrong as this is, that's kind of smart, if it, it, but it, sh it shows how hard their hearts were. Their hearts were. Their, your, your roommate, right? Your roommate's like, hey, I need a ride to work. Could you drive me? You're like, sorry, bro. My car is Corbin. I've dedicated it to God, and all the gas in it is just to bring people to God. And he's like, oh, okay. Like, that, that'd be weird, right? But it, your in-laws, they're coming from out of town and you're honestly, like, you're not super into them. They're like, hey, I know you got a spare bedroom. I'm looking for a place to stay. You're like, man, I would love you to stay with me, but the spare room is Corbin. It's the place where we worship God every morning. And so I'm sorry, I can't have anything unclean coming in and defiling it. I've given my spare room only to God, right? Someone's like, hey, I need, I need to borrow a little money to pay rent. This was a tight month. Rather than helping them, you're like, all my money has been declared Corbin. I've given it to God and it's only for him, so I can't give it to you. That, that would be nice, right, to have that loophole. That's what the Pharisees had done. They said, all of our stuff is Corbin. We've given it to God and therefore we can't actually use it to help anybody else. And Jesus said in verse 13, he said, and many other such things you do. This wasn't the only thing, washing my hands to show God how righteous I am. I'm declaring my house Corbin before God and I'm giving all my money to God. All of these things were just small symptoms. There was many other things that the Pharisees had done where they were placing their own traditions, their own set of righteousness, their own standards for holiness. They were placing it above the word of God rather than bringing their convictions and their traditions under the authority of God. So the question is two things. Number one, how did the Pharisees get to this point and that's really important to know because in answering that question, we can also answer the question, how have we gotten to this point? Because this isn't just a problem with the Pharisees. That's the problem. As we think, oh, that's the Pharisees. This is a problem that has crept into the church as well. And so if we understand what got the Pharisees to this point, then we can see what has gotten parts of our hearts to this point as well. So there were three steps. I would just call it three steps to becoming like the Pharisees. And they're all pretty simple and basic. If you're a note taker, you can write these things down. Number one, the Pharisees added their traditions which were made up by their own convictions. They added their traditions to the scriptures as useful supplements. So that was phase one, which in, initially it isn't that, doesn't seem like that bad of a thing. It's like, oh, I, I wanna wash my hands before I eat. Oh, I wanna say this routine prayer before I eat. Oh, whatever. They, they added their traditions, which were made up by their convictions. They added those as supplements to the scripture. So they started, they, they still were adhering to the scripture, but they said, we're also gonna add in what we think. Number Number two, the Pharisees over time gave equal authority to their traditions and equal weight to their convictions and began to place them on the same level with the authority of the scriptures. So number two was over time, they became equal. At the first, it was like, okay, we're gonna add these things in. We're gonna do our own thing as well. And then over time, their own convictions and their own traditions, they held them to an equal standard. They said, yes, we wanna uphold the word. We wanna do what the Bible says, but as equally, we wanna do what we think is right as well and what we think makes us holy and how we feel. And they made the playing field equal. And then number three, the third step over time, the Pharisees over time placed their own traditions, which were rooted in their own own convictions, they placed them above the scriptures, making the word of God irrelevant. And this is ultimately what Jesus is addressing. He's saying that you have left the commandment of God to hold to the tradition of men. But it's important to note that that wasn't just an overnight thing. It wasn't like these people hated the word. These are religious leaders. These were pastors of the day. It wasn't like, they're like oh, we hate the scriptures. No, 
It, it slowly over time was we're gonna add our own stuff into the mix, but we still respect the Bible the most. Then over time, their own tradition, their own convictions became equal with the scriptures. And then over time, their hearts became hard and they said, you know what? We're actually placing what we think and what our tradition and what our convictions are above the scriptures. And it's so important to notice this pattern and the, to, to understand this because we live in a culture where there are many Christians who have now rejected the Bible or at least rejected portions of the scriptures. And they say, oh, I'm just living to, you know, my, my own convictions and my own traditions and doing Christianity the way that I think rather than the scriptures. We live in a culture where this is a problem inside the walls of the church. And again, the pattern is always the exact same thing. If you know somebody who's a Christian who claims to follow Jesus and yet their life doesn't look like it, they're kind of doing their own thing. And you're like, man, What's going on? The pattern's always the exact same thing. They, they, their, their heart genuinely was, oh man, I wanna live under the word and follow Jesus and all that. But over time, they start to bring their own traditions and their own way they wanna follow Jesus and they bring their own convictions into the mix. And then over time, how they feel becomes equal with what the scripture says. And then as time goes by even more, they place how they feel and what they want above the scriptures. And now the word of God is completely irrelevant in their life. That is the pattern every single time. It was the pattern in the life of the Pharisees at the time of Jesus, and it's the pattern that we see creeping into the church today as well. And so I have two things from this that I think are really important to address that I wanna share and speak into a little bit. These are two main points. Number one, following Jesus means coming under the authority of the scriptures, not the other way around. Following Jesus means coming under the authority of the scriptures, not the other way around. I don't bring my convictions and my traditions under, uh, above the scriptures, I, I bring them under it. So if you are here and you claim to be a follower of Jesus, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you have to understand this, that being a follower of Jesus means you are living under the authority of the scriptures. Jesus said in verse seven, speaking of the Pharisees, he said, in vain do they worship me. He said in verse eight, you leave the commandment of God. He said in verse 13, you make void the word of God. What Jesus is saying here is if you fail to honor the authority of the scriptures, you fail to worship God. We have to get that because there's so many people who think I'm worshiping God. I'm following Jesus. I'm a Christian. And Jesus says to these people, he says, you are not honoring and living under the authority of the word. And he says, you have failed to worship me. You, your, your worship to me is actually in vain. It's not true worship. And so the authority of the scriptures and the authority of God, the worship of God, those rise and fall together. You can't say I worship God. I follow Jesus, but reject the scripture. It, it just can't happen. The two are intimately connected. And if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus had the highest view of God of any person on the face of the earth because he was God and he was so connected to the Father. But Jesus also had the highest view of scriptures. Jesus didn't say, oh, I'm into God. I'm into my relationship with God. But the scriptures, no, like I don't need that as much. Jesus knew that these two things were intimately connected. 78 times in the ministry of Jesus, he quoted the scriptures, which at that time was the Old Testament. And he said, as it is written, have you not heard? 78 times. Jesus was living his life according to what the scripture had taught. Jesus referred to the Old Testament as the scriptures. He called them the scriptures. He referred to them as the word of God. He didn't say this is just a cool book with good ideas. He said, this is the word of God. He referred to the Old Testament as the wisdom of God. So over and over and over in Jesus's life, we see that Jesus held in very high standard, not just his relationship with God, but the authority of the scriptures as well. In fact, Jesus's entire life and his entire ministry and his entire work was based around the scriptures, meaning you cannot claim to follow Jesus and not come under the authority of the scriptures. You can't say, I follow Jesus, but I just don't like the Bible. 
I want to do the Jesus thing, but not the Bible thing, not the scriptures thing. To reject the authority of the scriptures is to reject a relationship with Jesus, is to reject true worship of God. That's what Jesus was saying of the Pharisees. He says, you have worshiped me in vain. You left the commandment of God. You don't know and you don't know what true worship is. It all comes from and flows through a relationship with God, which happens through living under the authority of the scriptures. But it's not just, again, we need to understand, it's not just saying, I reject the Bible. I want nothing to do with that. Most Christians wouldn't say like they're at that point, but it's not just saying I completely reject the scripture, but if there's other areas of your life where you say there's other things in my life that have equal authority, equal value, equal influence in my life of scripture, I would say that's primarily the danger because we don't go from like, yeah, like I'm into Jesus, I love Jesus, I love the Bible, just to like, oh, I hate it, I completely like disregard it, I want nothing to do with it. Again, it's a slow process, so it's not just rejecting the authority of the word, but it's letting other things in our life have equal value and equal authority in our life. And I've seen this time and time again in our culture today. It's, oh yeah, like, I know the Bible says that, but I'm gonna trust what the experts say on this. I know the Bible says this, but, but now philosophy is, is teaching us this. Psychology is teaching us this. So I'm gonna trust what the experts say rather than the Bible. I'm still a Christian and I still agree with most of it, but now I'm gonna go with what the experts say and that we hold on to equal playing as the scripture. Or you know what? I'm gonna trust what science says. I know the Bible, I still believe in the Bible, but what science says here actually contradicts what the Bible taught there. And so I'm gonna agree with what science says rather than what the Bible said. Or you know what? I know, I, I believe the Bible most of it, but there's a couple things that my heart just, it doesn't sit well with me in my heart. And so I'm gonna go with on this particular issue what my personal feelings are or what I grew up being taught. That, that's not the same as the Bible. I'm gonna go with my own convictions and how I feel. And so it's not that we just go and say, I want nothing to do with the Bible. It's that what we do is begin to hold things in equal value. I'm gonna trust the experts. I'm gonna trust my own convictions. I'm gonna trust science. I'm gonna trust fill in the blank. The danger is when we start to elevate those things and place them on the same level as the scriptures. Now, here's the thing. When we do that on particular issues, that's called selective obedience. And selective obedience is not obedience at all. Selective obedience is called convenience. And this is sadly what a lot of people's Christianity is now. It's selective obedience. It's a convenience Christianity. Most Christians say, yeah, like I like most of the Bible, but there's certain parts where now I'm agreeing with science or the experts or my own convictions and I don't like those things. And so we just pick and choose which parts of our Christianity we want to live out because it's convenient for us, because it's nice for us, because it's easy with us, because we're not offended by it. And then we pick the parts and choose that we don't like. And so we add in by addition our our own traditions, our own convictions, our own expertise, our own biases of what culture has taught us, we add those in and subtract those parts of the scriptures. And that's what's happening to the church at large in America. Christianity is just becoming this convenience thing of like, you can kind of pick and choose the parts of Jesus you like and the parts of Jesus that you don't like. But again, that's not what it means to actually follow Jesus. And here's the reality, even as a Christian, even for me, there are parts of the Bible I like and there are parts of the Bible I don't like because they challenge my flesh. They challenge what culture teaches me. They challenge how I was raised. They challenge me to do certain things that I wouldn't normally be comfortable doing. They challenge the selfish nature of me. For me, there's parts of scripture I like and there's parts I don't like. For you, there's gonna be parts of the scripture you like, there's gonna be parts you don't like. There's gonna be parts of the scripture that comfort you and you're like, wow, I love that. And then there's gonna be parts that offend you. You're gonna read things in the Bible and go, oh, that's offensive. Can't believe Jesus says that or calls me to that standard or the Bible says, and, and, and it's gonna offend you a little bit. There's gonna be parts of the Bible that you understand. There's gonna be parts that you don't understand. When we, our, our relationship with the scripture is not just, oh, everything's so nice. I love it all, this is so easy, this is so amazing. We need though the entirety of the scripture for that very purpose because it reveals to us the heart of God. It shows us who Jesus actually is and who he wants us to be and that's hard. Following Jesus isn't easy. 
giving of your time to serve other people, giving of your finances to bless other people, discipleship, taking up your cross, dying to yourself and following Jesus. That's not easy. That's not fun. And that's why we need the entirety of the word for that very purpose. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16. He said, all scripture, the things I like and don't like, all of it is breathed out by God It's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. So if all scripture is breathed out by God and all of it's profitable, not just to teach me and go, oh, that's nice, but also he says for reproof, for correction, training in righteousness, that's why we need it all to be trained in righteousness because the natural heart and the natural man is not righteous. The natural heart and the natural man like the Pharisees wants to be self-righteous, wants righteousness to be what I want it to be. And we need the scripture to show us what true righteousness actually is. And so the question for you and the question for me is what parts of your life Have you elevated or brought in your own convictions or your own traditions and placed them on a level playing field with the scriptures? What areas of your life, what things that you believe, what values that you hold to, do you say, you know what? I know the scripture says this, but I don't really like that. And so I'm gonna bring in how I wanna live my life and establish my traditions and this is how I feel and these are what my convictions are and this is what my heart is telling me and this is what the experts I trust are saying. Which parts of your life have you brought certain things and said, I'm gonna make them level with the scripture or maybe you're at the spot, maybe you're at stage three, like the first season, you've already placed them above the scriptures and now you want nothing to do with the word of God. This is not just a problem outside the church, it's a problem inside the church. So you have to evaluate your heart. And this isn't something that I would say like, yeah, just right now, figure out what that is. This is something I would really challenge you and encourage you to to pray into, even over this next week and this next season of your life, God, what things in my life am I believing culture? Am I believing my own traditions? Am I believing my own convictions in equal authority with your word? And once you realize what those things are, then you you can wrestle with those things. You can actually wrestle with what the scripture says. You can have an honest relationship with God and say, you know what, God, I'm actually having a really hard time with what the scripture teaches here. The Pharisees, I'm having a really hard time that your disciples aren't washing your hands. That was really offensive to them. What are the things in the scripture that are offensive to you? What are the things in the scripture that you're having a hard time understanding, that you're having a hard time swallowing, that you're having a hard time actually living by and practicing in your relationship with Jesus? And if you claim that you are a follower of Jesus and you actually want a deeper relationship with Jesus, the most healthy thing you can do isn't just gonna be throw those things out and say, well, I'm gonna go with what I think anyways. It's to bring those things actually to Jesus and to say, dude, I'm I'm having a hard time with this. I'm wrestling with this, I'm struggling with this, this particular issue, this particular sin, this particular struggle, whatever it is, it's to actually go to the scriptures and to wrestle with God. And so this is what I wanna challenge you in. This is something that we all need to actually wrestle with God, to say, I'm struggling with this, I'm wrestling with this, I don't like this, this does not speak to what I've actually been taught or how I've believed or how I've thought, and so I'm gonna come before you and I'm gonna wrestle through those things. So I wanna challenge you in that. This week, uh, just take, take time. Maybe you need to journal some things out. Maybe you need to get away and just have some time in silence and solitude and be still before the Lord and really look at your heart because only God knows and you. That's the reality. God knows perfectly those things that you're wrestling with. And a lot of times we don't know them because you're just going a million miles an hour. You never stop and take time to actually say, God, here's the things I'm wrestling through. Here's the things I'm struggling with. Here's the things that culture is bringing in that are, con- that are contrary to your word. And yet I feel that they're taking equal authority in my life. You can never really understand what those things are unless you kind of slow down and take some time to process those with the Lord. So I wanna challenge you guys in that. Uh, man, even this week, take time to search your heart and to see what those things are that, uh, that God may be showing you. Man, you've, you've placed these things and you've elevated these things. Uh, to a level where they are now equal with the scriptures. So number one, following Jesus means that we come under the authority of the scriptures, not the other way around. Number two, what we learned from this text, we'll close with this final point. Number two is this, following Jesus is a matter of the heart. 
Following Jesus is a matter of the heart. Verse six, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, these people honor me with their lips They appeared to be singing the right songs, saying the right things. They honor me with their lips. He says, but their heart is far from me. Again, the worship of the Pharisees, it gave the appearance of somebody who loved God. If you looked at the Pharisees, you would be like, wow, those are like super Christians. They were doing all the right things. It looked like they had it all together, but it was merely outward. It was not from the heart. The posture of their heart was not in the right place, which is why Jesus said that they are hypocrites because outwardly they were doing the right things and inwardly their hearts were actually far from God. And that's what's freaky. That, that, that's what's worrisome is that it is possible to be doing all the right things. It's possible to be living under the authority of the word, to be obeying the scriptures and doing what the scriptures teaches us, but to be doing them for all the wrong reasons. So it's not just, I need to live under the authority of the word and say, okay, I guess I'll do what the Bible says. I don't do it just to do it because that's pharisaical. That's what the Pharisees were doing. That, that's religion. You can do all the right things, but if your heart is not in the right place, you're just as big of a hypocrite and a Pharisee as the Pharisees that Jesus was calling out here. So choosing to live under the authority of the scriptures, the reason we do that isn't just for formal compliance. It's not just, okay, well, the Bible says it, so I guess I'll do it. Okay, it says I have to do these things. That sucks. I don't really want to, so I guess I'm gonna do it. We don't live under the authority of the scripture just to do it. We live under the authority of the scriptures so that our hearts will be closely connected with God. And that's the part of Christianity that so many people miss. They think Christianity is, well, I just do all this stuff. I just obey the Bible and it kind of sucks. And I don't really want to, but if I'm a Christian, I guess I have to obey all these things. So I guess I will. That's not it. That's not what Jesus wants for you. He doesn't want you to obey the scripture so that you're just doing the right things. He wants us to live under the authority of the word so that our hearts will be closely connected to him. And we can do it. We can live under the word and do all the right things and have our heart be so removed. It benefits you absolutely nothing if you bring your body to church on Sunday, but you leave your heart at home. Here you are, checking that box went to church again, did that thing again, and your heart's not here. It benefits you absolutely nothing to come and take communion. Okay, God, taking communion again, thanks for what you did. To take communion and not actually say, God, what is this sin in my life I need to repent of as I'm remembering your body that was broken, as I'm remembering your blood that was poured out for my sin. It it benefits you absolutely nothing. It benefits you nothing to come and raise your hands in church, sing all of your favorite songs, and yet not be engaged in saying, wow, this is for God. Not because this is fun for me or this is my favorite song. I'm I'm worshiping God. I'm praising God because he truly is good. It benefits you nothing to read your Bible because that's what you should do as a Christian. Go home and read your Bible. Make sure you do it every day. That will do nothing for you if your heart is not in the right place, saying, I'm coming to this not because I'm supposed to do this as a Christian. I'm coming to this because I wanna know God. I wanna know the heart of God. I wanna be closely connected to the person of Jesus. And sadly, Christianity has just become like every other religion. Just do all this stuff. It's not about doing all this stuff. We do those things from a heart place of saying, it's because I want to know God. It's because I want to know Jesus. If our heart is not positioned towards Christ, then all of our obeying the scripture, all of our singing worship songs and praying and reading the Bible and serving and tithing, all of that is wood, hay, and stubble. It's all filthy rags. It's all worthless if my heart is not positioned towards Christ. That was the problem with the Pharisees. Externally, they had it all together. They were in church. They were giving of their time. They were tithing. They were serving people. Their hearts weren't engaged though. Their hearts weren't in the right place. And the heart is what God is chiefly concerned with. 
It's not just, God, I'm gonna obey the Bible because that's what I'm supposed to do. It's, I wanna live under the authority of the word so that my heart can be connected to the heart of God because the heart of God is directly connected to the scriptures. This is the word of God. This is what he has spoken. This is his self-disclosure, his self-revelation. And so if I want to know God, I see him in the scriptures. Man, we have to get this. If we just get the first part, let's live under the authority of the word, that's just religion. That's just, well, okay, that's good, that's nice, but we miss it if we miss the heart piece. Jesus said, you're worshiping me with your lips, you're doing it all in vain though, because your heart's actually far from me. And when Jesus came to this earth, the whole reason that he did that, that Jesus came to this earth, that he went to the cross, that he died for our sin, that he was buried in the grave and that he resurrected from the grave three days later, all of that was so that Jesus could give us a new heart that could actually experience his love, that could actually be in fellowship with God because naturally we had no ability to do that because of our sin. Our hearts were so far from God. We're gonna continue the heart part two next week where Jesus says, from the heart come all evil thoughts and sexual immorality and theft and adultery and murder and all this stuff, it all comes from the heart. But Jesus, when he came to the earth and when he died and he went to the cross, it wasn't just to forgive our sin, it was to purify our heart. The very thing that the religious leaders of Jesus, they were trying to do on their own, Jesus came and did that. He came to give us a new heart that recognizes God's love for us and then responds in love as well and says, I wanna follow Jesus because that's the desire of my heart. Not just because that's what I'm supposed to do as a Christian, but because my heart has been changed. And this is what Ezekiel prophesied of in Ezekiel 36, verse 26. He said, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. This is what Jesus made possible through his death, burial, and resurrection. That God would give us a brand new heart and then fill that heart with his Holy Spirit so that we now, can say, God, I'm walking in obedience, not because this is what I have to do to be a good person, but because I desire to, because you're changing the desires of my heart. And that's why we need to identify, by the way, the things where we're holding our own convictions, our own tradition, what culture says, equal with the word. We need to identify those in our new heart because if we don't, then, then we're missing out on what God has for us. God in our new heart shows us and exposes the things in our life that we need to continue to work on as well. And so following Jesus is not just about doing good stuff. It's not just about doing the right stuff. It's about having our heart connected to God. It's relational. It's not religiosity, do all this stuff. It's relational. It's I'm in a relationship with the person of Jesus. I trust in his finished work on the cross. I, by faith, have approached him and have given my heart to him. And now, I don't wanna just say, God, I give my heart to you that moment I place my faith in you. Every day, I'm gonna come and say, God, I'm giving my heart to you again. So what parts of my heart need to be exposed? What parts of my heart need to be changed? What parts of my heart am I holding my own convictions and my own traditions equal with the scriptures? God, search my heart, know my heart. I don't wanna just do the right things and do the right stuff. I wanna do it for the right reason, from the right heart posture, which is intimacy with the person of Jesus. So in closing, the, the question for us and the, the question for you is simply this. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you at church right now? Like, why are you here? Was it because that's what you're supposed to do if you're a Christian, you're supposed to go to church? If that's the only reason you're here, you are so missing out on what God wants to do in your heart. Why do you read your Bible? What's the purpose of it? Is, is it just because that's what you're supposed to do? No, we're missing it. It's to know the heart of God. So, 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 so what is it for you? Why is it that you're here? Why is it that you're professing to follow Jesus or trying to follow Jesus or proclaim to be a Christian? Why is it? Is it just to go through the motions and just to do the right things and the right stuff? Or is it because your heart is actually trusted in the gospel and longs for more of Jesus in your life? That's what we have to search out. And here's the thing. 
If you genuinely are here and you're genuinely wanting to follow Jesus, there's always gonna be things in your life that we have to search for because the world creeps back in and our own flesh creeps back in and starts to pull us away and our own convictions creep back in and culture creeps back in, which is why we need to continually search our heart and say, God, why am I here? Here I am Sunday morning listening to a Bible study again. Here I am singing some songs again. Here I am going to church again. Here I am doing whatever's again. It can just become so routine that we forget why we're doing what we're doing. And so it's important to search our hearts and to allow God to search our hearts and to say, man, if there is anything in me and if there's anything in this heart that is not God what you want, expose that, reveal that and change that. And today that's what God wants to do in each and every one of our lives. He wants to continue to change and transform and sanctify our hearts, that our hearts might be holy, that our hearts might be purified, that our hearts might know God, that our hearts might marvel at the beauty of the gospel and what Christ has done for us. Amen? Amen.